All right, we are back. I'm Ryan Grimm, joined here by Destiny and Congressman Rokana, who left to go vote to try to keep the government open. Unsuccessful. Failed. Unsuccessful. So tell us about the, what, what, was the, what was the mood in the room? So basically, the Republicans had their own bill that was going to keep the government open, but they were going to strip wokeism <laughs> out of the world. As you put it, yeah. one, 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 what did you say? Yeah, wokeism, wokeism one. Wokeism, wokeism one. <laughs> Republican yeah. zero. Yeah. So it went down. They yeah. couldn't even get... Republicans to get on their extreme Because the, the cuts were so drastic. I mean, cutting uh, funding for poor schools, cutting nutrition, cutting heating assistance, and cutting... moderate Republicans, mostly the defective... It was a moderate... Well, you, now you can't even make heads or tails. Yeah. So you got some of the Freedom Caucus folks who don't think it goes far enough. You've got moderate Romans. You've got some people who just want to bloody up McCarthy. So there's, there's no... You can't figure out who the no votes are. But uh, it went down pretty handily. And so this wouldn't have passed the Senate. So they're not even at a gate point right now. We're passing something that could get to the president's desk. They can't even get their own members in line. Yeah. So government shutdown coming, but let's, let's talk says, about something else. Well, or even, I guess, related to this. And I, so I was born in 88, so not as uh, long of a view of the government. Have shutdowns like this always been a feature of the government like this commonly? Or is this just like a new path going forward where we're going to obstruct in every single way possible? And now we're just going to be looking forward to fights on funding the government or raising the debt cap every few years. So unfortunately, the shutdowns are fairly common. I mean, they've go been going on since 70s and 80s, and they're often shutdown fights. I mean, that's not uncommon. What's uncommon, though, is the frequency yeah. uh, with which they're now happening. Uh, and what's uncommon is people threatening uh, the speaker's chair uh, if they don't get exactly what they want. The other thing that's uncommon is usually when someone gives their word, they keep it. And I think McCarthy candidly have er had every intent to keep his word to the president uh, and then now is having to backtrack uh, because he doesn't have his votes of his own caucus. And that's uncommon. So th there are a bunch of people on the left who are watching, who watched the speaker fight play out over, over four dramatic days. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, and then they're watching this kind of thing. You know, they've, you've got Matt Gates going to the floor, burning the place down. And he yeah. goes on Steve Bannon's podcast and they, they trash McCarthy and everybody calls Congress and it's this gigantic fight. And there's some on the left who are like, I want some of this fight. I'm on here. I'm, uh, uh, we got to make sure that De Destiny and Ryan Grimm have a bigger uh, outreach than Steve Bannon. That's but what I'm told. Get, if we get a bigger one, does that mean we're going to then fuel like this kind of shutdown energy or like what? Like, wh why isn't there on the left a, a kind of Gates right. faction? Well, I, I, I mean, I want you to push back, but I think the left doesn't get enough credit. I mean, there was a a progressive faction that got on board with Bernie and Warren at a significant risk. When I decided to co-chair Bernie's campaign, I was the only member of Congress in the entire Congress endorsing him. When AOC endorsed, when uh, others, Pramila endorsed, they took huge risks and others were with Warren. So that fight got us Biden, who's now on the picket lines at labor, who proposed mental, uh, I mean, uh, dental vision and and, and hearing for health care, proposed child care, proposed a $15 wage, got uh, infrastructure, got the IRA, the largest climate bill, and progressives fought there. We shaped the American Rescue Plan. We pushed very hard. We got the child tax right. Now, did we have failures? Yes. We didn't get enough. On, I called for the po uh, firing of the parliamentarian on the $15 wage. We didn't succeed. We didn't succeed in pushing on voting rights in the end of the filibuster. But I guess the question was, what more did they want us to do? Like, how would a shutdown have achieved those goals? I feel like Biden's legislative agenda has been more aggressive than I think anybody would have hoped mm -hmm. uh, coming into this, like, historically divided uh, Senate and everything. I think there were a lot of people, even far left, even center left, that didn't really hope for much, that there would be, you know, the American Rescue Plan, we'd have some sort of COVID thing, and then after that, it would basically just be nothing. Um, but, you know, as you've said, you know, um, with the uh, the IRA passing and all, all the other legislation that Biden has worked on, it seems like he's done a really effective job at moving legislation through such a divided Senate, which I think has been really impressive. Um, just on the what you said about the left not getting enough credit for what they have done. Uh, I agree with that. I mean, yeah. I, I think Biden has been far more progressive than people expected. I mean, he's been more progressive than you expected. No? For sure. I mean, yeah, now, sure. Now, if, I if I would have too, predicted yeah. any of this, it would yeah, it'd be crazy. And I, I give Biden some, yeah. you know, some of that credit of having the sensibility and, and the values to do that. But I also give the progressives credit. I give the 2018 progressive class credit. I give Bernie credit. I give Warren credit 
Now, that's not to say, okay, everything is great. That's the, that progressives need to say, look, we haven't made progress on health care and health care being uh, free in this country like it is in so many other places. We haven't made progress on education. People are still burdened with student debt. We haven't made progress on the wages in this country. There's still wages that have stagnated and ultimately people's take home pay doesn't feel like enough. And we've got to have a bolder uh, economic populist agenda. What's that? Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. We're going to pause for a second. Yes. Yeah. All right. Pausing. We'll be back. We'll be right back. Are we, is audio hot? Are we? Okay, I want a question. Earlier, we spoke about how, uh, from the American public side, it, you just have people that go to Congress and they vote on legislation. And for a lot of people, we think that's kind of all that happens. But the relationships that you guys form in the Senate and in the House are actually really important to how you do day to day business. So I'm somebody, and you know, the rest of the country watched eagerly as the Justice Dems came into Congress. It seems like there was kind of this like combative tone. Uh, you had the force the vote stuff. There's a lot of that type of discourse going on. And then it seems like people like AOC have kind of settled into a more comfortable rhythm of right. Like I'm going to push you guys, but I'm also going to work with you guys in a more effective manner than just being very combative, I guess. I'm just kind of curious on like a personal level, how do you navigate your like congressional relationships versus like obligations that you have to your constituents. Like what does that day-to-day -day process look like? I'm so curious. Well, you need 218 votes to get anything done and you need votes on a committee to get anything done. So my philosophy has been, I don't compromise the values of being for Medicare for all, Bernie's bill or free public college or wealth tax or not uh, having PAC money and lobbyist money. Uh, but I try to find common ground with colleagues and I won't go on the floor and, you know, shame colleagues who may have a difference of, uh, of, of philosophy. I think some on the progressive side want us to do that. And I understand, you know, they want us to do what Matt Gates is doing to, to McCarthy. But at the end of the day, the Republican philosophy is stop government from funding things. So if things shut down, if things don't work, it's not the end of the world. Our philosophy is we really want funding for free public college and for Medicare for all. How are you going to do that if you're not going to win over people? I, I guess that's been the dilemma. So I know that there have been critiques of the Justice Democrats, of which I was the first one, and uh, in AOC and, and the squad, but they, they haven't moved on many of the issues. They're just trying to navigate to, to build power while being effective. Well, you, you took a big interpersonal risk in 2018 when during AOC's challenge to Joe Crowley, and people may forget this, Joe Crowley was considered to be the next speaker of the House. Like he, he, he might, have been. might even have challenged Pelosi. Pelosi yeah. only won re-election speaker because there was nobody to challenge her. Her slogan was, you can't beat somebody with nobody. And it's because Crowley had been the one that had been positioned for that. He needed some progressive support. He rolled out an endorsement that you had given him earlier. Yeah, but I endorsed him after he came out for Medicare for All. And so then he rolled it out like yes. right before the election. Yes. And you get hammered yes. on Twitter. Yeah. And you're like, you know what? I also endorse AOC. Yeah. And Corbin Trent, who was her, her communications director at the time, said that was so much better for us than if it had been a traditional endorsement yeah it became a meme almost because the, it, the kind of dual endorsement it brought, <laughs> it, brought, it brought so much attention to the race yeah and then that and crowley could not survive attention yeah like yes. he needed that race to be under the right. radar so how did you decide to kind of pull that trigger knowing that she's probably going to lose yeah and now you've taken a shot at the next speaker of the house well she was herself thought she was going to lose. Yeah. I was on Twitter with her and I didn't have her at the time her number, but we were DMing each other. <laughs> and a actually, you know, she was uh, fine. A lot of people around her uh, were pushing me to endorse her and uh, and uh, and she never pushed that. But once Crowley rolled out that endorsement, I think she DMed it and saying, well, look, I've got the whole world against me. And now the progressives are, you guys are against me too? Like, fine, I'll just g get to do it. I mean, it was very respectful. And I, I, I think that note, her outreach, and then thinking about how it was like when I was a young Indian American running against the establishment and people would walk in the other direction. And I was like, I just don't want to be part of doing that. So I'll endorse. 
And when I endorsed her, I said, look, I, I respect Crowley. I get that he's come for Medicare for all, but we've got to be for new voices. And she's an incredible new leader. I didn't think she'd become an AOC, but that she's going to have a very bright future. And I thought this is someone who's going to be uh, in there for, a, if not this time, in the future time. What would Crowley say to you? Oh, it was uh, it was heated. If, in fact, if you look at C-SPAN, there is a, a clip of him yelling at me on the House floor, uh, you know, really, uh, really? heated. I mean, we have now we have a cordial relationship and, you know, I don't wish him any negative things. And I know his his family is going through a tough time. But at that moment, it was heated. I mean, it was like, what what is he doing? I mean, that was a that just wasn't done. And, it, and I was getting some criticism from the uh, the left. It was like, why have you not revoked the Crowley endorsement? And actually, AOC, to her credit, I'm sure those tweets still exist, came to my defense and said, look, this guy's already walking the plank. Like, how far do you want him to go? This is good enough. She would have won anyway, given the margins. But this certainly contributed to her momentum because it was the first uh, person from the establishment to say, look, this person is serious and, and, and can win. I'm really proud of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Ryan and I covered that race. I remember right. that we were there on that victory night uh, together. That was a, an, ex, an incredibly exciting time and such a, a seismic moment for the insurgent left and the progressive movement and Justice Democrats more broadly. Uh, some of the criticism about Justice Democrats' strategy, in my opinion, is unfounded in the sense that they are trying to make as many gains as possible in really blue districts. And that is the, where you can get the most bang for your buck. Some people say, well, let's expand and go to purple areas of the country, run some progressive candidates there. Then their, you know, their batting average is going to be a lot lower, but you're still taking more shots to mix metaphors there. What's your assessment on how that strategy should should be yeah. employed, deployed? Well, there's no doubt to me that we can win in purple districts. I mean, look at Fetterman. He won in a quote unquote purple state. He ran on Medicare for all. He ran on taxing the ultra rich. He ran on political reform. Uh, and he's one of the most interesting members, in my view, uh, of, of uh, the entire Congress and having an impact because he's kind of a straight shooter. And so I do think we can win in these districts. But the challenge is that it's resources. I mean, they are so outmatched. And then when you've got bill millions of dollars in super PACs coming in against their candidates, I do think the Democratic Party should say no super PACs yes. in Democratic primaries. If you have, you can't unilaterally disarm with the Republican because it'd be unfair if you just had the Republican using super PACs and they always use that argument. So say, fine, in a general election, we're not gonna unilaterally disarm, but we should not be using super PACs in a Democratic primary for the House, Senate, or, or presidency. And any super PAC, whether it's a labor super PAC, whether it's a corporate super PAC, because you can't distinguish, then they'll get into, well, why can there be some super PAC or not at the other? And that to me, the, that's why the Justice Democrats are, are, are resource strapped because they've had to defend in these districts against an onslaught of resources. So they're looking and saying, okay, let's do a few races and win instead of spreading ourselves out thin and get zero, zero wins. But in concept, I agree with you. We should be fielding people everywhere. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I actually think the, the bluer districts is a better strategy, but sorry, go on, Ryan. I was just yeah, gonna yeah. say, I've got to run because I gotta go uh, tape something out. So it's always great to have you on here. I'm glad you're so open. I, I wish uh, more of your colleagues would do this. Do you ever, do you ever hear from them when I they see you out there and say, like, like yesterday we did a Twitter Spaces with yeah. unusual whales. Like, you're the, one of the few that does those types of. I think what happens is people are afraid of getting asked uh, uh, tough, tough questions. I, uh, you know, I was t telling uh, earlier with Emma. I mean, you know, she asked me about Moldy, and she asked me about my vote on socialism, and she asked me about uh, a fundraiser at David Sachs, right? Well, I go on MSNBC or CNN, I know those questions aren't going to come up. I know exactly what the questions are, and I know that if I say these things, it'll be fine. Or, or the, uh, uh, the stock conversation we had, people said, okay, you're for banning stocks, but your wife is uh, wealthy and she has a trust. And explain that, right? Yeah. My philosophy has been that you go in, you answer the best you can, you be transparent, and overall, people will build more trust for that than if you avoid the questions. A lot of other members and others think that it's bad. Like, why, why go and what if you make an error? And what if you say something that is dumb? Uh, what if someone on this panel makes a comment that is outrageous and you don't respond in time to condemn it? Then uh, you're in trouble. So they just think that the risk of it is very high. And I think we live in a different time. 
I have had people, I have had people excoriate me. I've gone on breaking points or uh, Brianna Joy or your program and, or, or sometimes the majority report and the, all the comments are negative. It's like kind of, Watch out, and then I'll, I'll run into the person on the, at the airport and they'll say, we just love that you go on. Yeah. We're for, you know, we, we, it, it earns a grudging respect. And so I'm a big proponent on more of our folks doing it on the right. They do it all the time. Mm -hmm. They run to Steve Bannon. They do. They do. All right. Well, th thank, thank you guys. You. Thanks for thank having you. me on here. Thank really you very appreciate much. Thank it. Thank you, Ryan. See you guys again soon. Yeah. Good seeing right. you. We're twinning, I see. Oh, I know. I meant to say that to you earlier. We had the right <laughs> idea. Yeah, Go. Um, I guess maybe I can ask you a question. I don't think I've heard you speak about this, but I feel like you'll bring a really unique perspective, which is, I don't know what you think about this. I feel like there's a lot of young men that feel super disillusioned and are getting really like caught up by like these Tates and anti savage yeah. people and just people who really kind of seem to rail against maybe even the entire democratic process. What do you think like Democrats can do to kind of like reach out to these young men and make these men feel like Democrats like care about their interests and needs? I haven't been asked that. It's a very thoughtful uh, question. I've read Richard Reeves' book on the disillusionment of uh, boys and men. I would say a couple things. One, people have to see the uh, economic prospects ahead of them, right? Uh, it used to be that you, you, if you worked hard, you'd have a shot at getting a house, you'd have a shot at being able to support your family, you'd be able to build wealth. Mm -hmm. And a lot of folks are just uh, disillusioned. They don't think they can ever buy a house. Yeah. They can't afford rent. They don't have a clear pathway to building economic wealth. So I think we have to talk about, in real ways, the economic challenges uh, that folks face. Uh, I think we have to talk about uh, why uh, certain values of respect and respect for uh, women, respect for our family matter in a society and that it can't just be a, a free for all conversation, that there's a reason that society evolved to have certain standards and throwing things out, throwing the rule book out uh, it, it, without reflecting on why those norms or rules exist. Uh, is is not being macho or brave. It's actually just being dumb at times and uh, and having those honest conversations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that just to, to to add to your point, so much of the conversation surrounding young male alienation ends up falling back on it's like, well, it's the feminists, right? I mean, they're the ones creating these new rules and no one knows what it means. But I think so much of it really is general societal alienation, yeah. right? When you don't know uh, if you miss a paycheck, if you're going to get evicted from your apartment, when you don't have health care that you can rely on, um, it creates a general level of societal anxiety that is really acute. And it's not just men that feel anxious or alienated. It's women. It's everybody in this in this country. So, I mean, generally, what's your sense on the mental health crisis being addressed from an economic perspective in Congress and what can be done to alleviate it. We're not doing nearly enough uh, to, to address the anxiety that the American dream is slipping away for people. I mean, we, what we need to be doing is providing free health care through Medicare for all, free education or career training, making sure that the corporate Wall Street isn't buying up all the housing and having some plan for people to be able to buy a house, uh, some sense that they can stand on their two feet and have an economic a uh, future where they can support a family. But if you have men, young men uh, or women, but if, who don't think that they can support a family, uh, who don't think that they can get a house, who don't think that they have any economic dignity, that I think is alienating. And it's alienating for young people across the board, but it has a gender component. Now, I, I what has come is people are blaming uh, some of the fem feminism and empowering men of women and empowerment of minorities. So. First, to them who have a problem with that, I'd say, tough, get yeah, over yourself. Right. That's, you know, you're not, if you're, if you're going to rely on uh, being unequal and being domineering and having uh, unequal uh, advantage uh, uh, to have a status, uh, then you're just wrong and you're on the wrong side of history. And I, I think we have to be that direct with, with folks who have that sentiment. 
But if your alienation stems because you don't see how you can be productive and have the American dream, then let's talk and, and, and let's be, uh, let's have a conversation. But also, I think that we have to be a direct in the defense of feminism, right? We've got one side that's blaming feminism and we don't have anyone out there being like, well, here's why we have feminism, because we want talented people to have or their God given potential manifest. And we've had hundreds of years of that not happening. And if you got a problem with that, let me tell you, you're on the wrong side. Yeah. That, yeah. I think it feels like the scary issue that's come up is for a long time there's been a big societal push to kind of help women um, achieve at, at minimum equality and now surpassing men when it comes to different areas of life, whether it be workplace opportunities or college right. education. Those are the two big ones. I think a lot of the fear for younger men that exist in society today is it felt like there were people willing to set up a big societal infrastructure to kind of bolster women, which I think we've done exceptionally well. But now as men have continued to fall behind, especially over COVID, I think the dropout rates in colleges for men far exceeded women. Uh, now you're in an area where I don't know if they feel like Democrats or progressive people on the left are gonna come out with a, we need to help the men now catch up in college. I think they're worried that that voice doesn't exist in the same way that it did for women. And then because that voice doesn't exist on the left, people look to the Jordan Petersons, the Andrew Tates, the um, all of the people on the right that are willing to capture the ear of those people, the Dennis Pragers and everything. Uh, yeah, I think that's kind of the fear. Is it feels like on the left, they're scared to talk to majority class sometimes, whether it's white, whether it's men. And then they end up looking elsewhere to, to the right, unfortunately. Uh, that's a, a, a fair uh point. And here's what I'd say. The first thing we did in Congress was not pass child care, which would have disproportionately helped the two million women who were out of work get back into work. We passed infrastructure uh -huh. and infrastructure actually helped the jobs were 70 percent met. So this idea that the Democratic Party isn't doing things that also help men factually isn't the case. Now, maybe our communication uh -huh. is a problem. But if you had a if you asked me what the highest priority if in COVID was, I wouldn't have told you to go past infrastructure. I would have said go past child care. That was what was that was what was hurting the economy. Uh, Eighty five percent of women say that child care, lack of child care is why they leave a job. Mm -hmm. Now, what do I think we should be doing with men and communities that ha have also felt, felt alienation? I've gone to Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I've gone to Warren, Ohio. I've gone down River, Michigan where you had large amounts of men lose their jobs, lose factories, lose industry. Uh, what are, why did we just watch while that happened? Why can't we have a massive reindustrialization plan? Bill, bring the new steel plants back that also have a low carbon footprint. Talk about bringing new jobs and economic opportunity. That's gonna help men and women. It's gonna help black and white folks, but it's certainly gonna help the people you're talking about. It's gonna help the white working class as well and the, it, it address the issues of debts of despair and invest in uh, healthcare there, invest in mental health counseling there. So I, 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 I think that there is an importance of showing up in communities. And, and we've posted videos where there are a lot of white men who are being helped. We've posted videos where a lot of African-American black men and women are being helped. So I, 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 I think you can't exclude communities and you have to understand that there are definitely communities that are hurting and, 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 and men uh, who are also hurting as long as you never compromise on the principles of feminism. Don't blame equality for your problems. Don't, yeah. don't blame equality opportunity for your problems. Okay. Uh, blame society hollowing out the working and middle class. Yeah, and just to comment, I do. I really agree that the issue it feels sometimes is more a perception one than the reality of what's happening. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I, and and just bringing up the uh, child care. I'm I'm curious. I know the Republicans obviously have a slim majority in the House, but the child tax credit during COVID reduced child poverty by forty percent. Um, is it a priority for you when hopefully the Democrats take back the House in 2024 to? Uh, re-up the expanded child tax credit and make that more permanent policy because I think that's we've tried it and it's worked Joe Manchin and the Republicans killed it but I would love to see that be more permanent absolutely I mean we know now that poverty is a policy choice in this country we had the child tax credit which was basically 300 bucks for each child for working in middle class families so you made 50,000 you have a kid you'd get 300 bucks you have two kids you get 600 bucks a month People were using it, we know statistically, to buy school supplies, to buy clothes for their kids, buy nutrition uh, food for their kids. And then we let, and poverty dropped 40%, then we couldn't extend it and poverty has gone up 40%. And the Republicans blamed 
Joe Biden, who actually brought it down. What we should be doing is extending it. But beyond that, we need, why can't we have childcare at $10 a day in this country? And people say, oh, that's so cheap. How are you going to do that? Childcare is broken. It costs $10,000 for an average family, and the childcare workers are broke. Mm. I mean, how do you have the system not working either, either way? If you did $10 a day, that's still $3,600 a year. That's still a lot of money. We should be funding childcare in this country the way we fund public education. They're doing it in Canada. They do it in every other industrialized country. You say, how do you pay for this stuff? Pay for it by taxing people in my district. I, I, this is one thing I've not understood for the life of me. The guy who represents all the millionaires and billionaires is telling you raise their taxes. I represent a district that has one third of the S&P 500. It's $10 trillion. How is this a hard vote for anyone else in the country? Like all the billionaires and millionaires, most of them are in my district or in New York. If I can be for this, how can other people not be for taxing the ultra wealthy? And not to mention all the productivity gains from the people that then can work too because they've got childcare for their children. They don't have to drop out of the economy completely to do childcare, you know? Exactly, $12 billion of gains yeah. is what is estimated in a yearly basis just by having people be able to live up to their talent. One thing that you mentioned that I think it, it had me thinking, which is essentially this perception issue, right? I think a lot of people get very kind of unsophisticated in what they blame. And you've brought up the economy a lot. Um, but one of the biggest issues I feel like I see in online politics is getting people interested in the economy in the way that the economy actually works, right? Versus like this like nebulous idea of economy. How do you, how do you get uh, average citizens to kind of buy into this idea that the economy matters, that these things need to be talked about, and to get sophisticated enough to understand like different ways that uh, bills and policies can actually improve economic standings for average Americans? Yeah. Well, we can't just lecture them about how they should feel about the economy. They say, a politician, we've created 13 million jobs. Mm -hmm. Unemployment is at record lows. Yeah. And they, they just kind of tune out. They're like, well, come on. You know, my salary hasn't gone up. Yeah. It costs me too much to rent. I, I go to the grocery store and it's costing me more. I am filling up my tank. It's costing more. And got, we got to be real with folks and be like, be honest that the working and middle class has gotten shafted for the past 40 years. Then we could say, look, President Biden is trying to fix this. He's not going to fix it overnight. Here's what he wants to do. Here's what he has done. He's providing funding to bring manufacturing back, infrastructure back. We have put money in people's pockets with stimulus checks and a child tax credit. Here's what the other side wants to do. We're not going to, they want tax cuts for the wealthy. They want deregulation. We're not going to pretend that your life is magically great. We're not going to try to sell you on something you don't feel. But we are going to try to say that the policies we're building, uh, done even more, is what's actually going to help improve your life and get you what you want. Most people don't want to be millionaires and billionaires. Some do more power to them. But most people just want a house, economic security, being able to live after their family. And they feel like they can't do that now. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, actually. Of It seems like authenticity is a really big thing for you specifically. You want to have the conversations that people are sometimes <clears throat> hesitant, which is why I think you're reaching out to the streamer world which is really cool. Um, as you said, I think you talked about it. If you go on CNN, you know the questions they're gonna ask you. Um, do you know if, like, what the reticence is beyond just like, we don't know what questions will be asked of like getting into places like TikTok? Because it seems like when politicians do that, it's really successful a lot of time. People love kind of that organic interaction with people that are actually making decisions that change their life. Yeah, well, I was uh, amused by Vivek Ramaswamy and I, I don't want to take an attack at him. I just, on the one hand, he's got this platform like uh, that people under 25 shouldn't vote. And then at the debate last night, he said, well, why are you on TikTok? We got to win the young vote. I said, you got to yeah, pick one side, buddy. Which which one are you on? I think it's okay if you want to attack Vivek Ramaswamy. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I, he's a bit of a well, I'm not going to find much fighting here. My words, yeah. not yours. Well, it's, a, it's just I don't want to get the guy more oxygen on something that's not yeah, going, yeah. going 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 far, far. But you know, I, I don't understand why we're not on, uh, we're on TikTok, uh, you know, we're, we're, I'm on these conversations. Do I have, I'm on the China Select Committee. Do I have concerns on, uh, on, on who manages TikTok? Sure, but that's, that has nothing to do with the millions of people who are on TikTok. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're on there. If you want an American company to buy it, fine, do that. But don't, why are you boycotting, communicating with, uh, uh, with Americans? You want just China to communicate with them? I mean, so I, I think we have to be in, on these platforms. I think you have to be real in terms of answering questions. What, the only thing Donald Trump was able to, to capture, because he's got absolutely no solutions, is he was able to say, 
your lives are terrible yeah. because of what this country did in offshoring and other things. And he channels grievance. And that is the first people have to say someone gets it and then they have to say, OK, here's what you're going to do about it. Our party has got to be more also about we get it like we understand what life is like for most people today. Yeah. And the reality is there's anxiety, right? I mean, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but most people are anxious. They're, this is not the American. My father, when he came in the 1960s, this was the place to be. This was we were sending a person to the moon. We were building things. There was good. You came to America. You were going to be part of the middle class, working class. Now we had issues of deep issues of race. My parents probably couldn't have gotten a meeting with a member of Congress, a staffer. We had issues, of course, in the black community that are incomparable and segregation. But and we've made progress there. But on the economy, we've hollowed out this idea of the American dream. And until we get to acknowledge that and focus on that. Uh, I, I feel like we're, we're not we're going to have people alienated. What do you do if you're a uh, viewer at home and you watch stuff like this and you want to see like people from Congress making more regular appearances on my stream or the majority report? Um, if you're like somebody at home, what's the best way to like support that? Would it be like writing letters to your congressman? No one reads or, like, those letters. It, no one reads them? Yeah, I'll be oh, geez, okay. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I'm just being blunt. Oh, you know, my they goodness. Got, you know, okay. say, you Is know, it phone letters. calls then? Yeah, Is no, it picking? Yeah. The, 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 the letters happen. And, you know, occasionally I, I read a random thing. But what they do is they summarize them. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, they summarize, OK, this is pro-Ukraine, anti-Ukraine, etc. And you get a, mm -hmm. a report. So if there's very big public sentiment on something, fine, do it. I'm not saying don't write to your member of Congress. But actually, if you tweet at them, because a lot of members are on on Twitter. I mean, I know the stream, but if you if you if you're on uh, social media and you catch their attention, you say, "Look, I I heard uh, Ro Khanna go on uh, with Destiny, go on on a Majority Report, go on these these things." I mean, get their attention on social media. Members are often there. Uh, show up to their town halls. Mm -hmm. Show up in person. Members of Congress showing up to their uh, them in person really makes a difference. Uh, try to get the attention of their staff and show up and meet their members of staff. Coming to Capitol Hill on Capitol Hill Day, that gets people's attention. Uh, but, you know, you have a lot of power to people out there. The, the millennials and Gen Z uh, are going to be a huge, huge voting block. And I feel people are getting how to communicate with them, right? They're not watching MSNBC like my parents do. They're not watching CNN. Uh, so tell people how that this is what you want them to do to, to get uh, your information. Your, this is how you're going to make your decisions. A bit of a hard pivot here, but I'm noticing that younger people are increasingly becoming uh, more disillusioned with United States foreign aid to Israel, right? And the fact that we are still supporting a regime that is engaging in apartheid. Um, and I... I, I I am discouraged as somebody that wants to see Palestinian humanity respected because it feels like no matter how far right Netanyahu and the Israeli government uh, pivot, it, it just nothing seems to change in terms of our relationship with providing them with money. Um, what is your sense of how things are shifting, if at all, in Congress um, about our relationship with Israel, given you know how things have escalated and essentially Netanyahu being quite clear that continued settlements and occupation is the goal. So I'm center left on the issue. I'm uh, not where you are, but I am also uh, more progressive than many. I'll start. I'll answer your question in detail. But let me just say on a vote we had last night because it's fresh on, on my mind. We had a vote about uh, will you permanently prohibit any U.S. money being used to move the embassy from Jerusalem back to Tel Aviv? And only 60 some of us in Congress voted no on that. I mean, our embassy never was in Jerusalem. That is, we weren't supposed to put it there because that's contested still for the final peace talks. And you don't even have a majority of Democrats willing to go back to the policy uh, of not having uh, a, a potential conversation about moving where our embassy is. So what am I for? I'm for uh, it, it, no new settlements. I'm for uh, our aid not being used in any way that violates human rights and the upholding of the Leahy law that is supposed to do that and tracking of that at the State Department. Uh, I'm for the smart lifting of the blockade in Gaza, which has led to 42 percent unemployment there. Uh, I, I'm for making sure that 
that, that, that you don't have settler violence against Palestinians or the demolition of homes. And I've been on a number of letters regarding that. I have for and supported Jan Schakowsky's resolution on making sure that America affirms dem democracy and the court in, uh, in Israel. All of this puts me in uh, the minority. Uh, and I've, but I've supported aid to, to Israel. I've supported the funding to Israel. I've support, said Israel is a is a, an ally, which I believe. Uh, if this is not where where you are, I mean, I know sure. you're more <laughs> more critical, and I just don't want to mislead people listening. I appreciate but, the but, candor, but but, yeah. but I think that even getting to my position is an uphill battle. Well, especially in Congress, yeah. And that's I think the frustration, at least for me. I mean. What is Israel's incentive to stop settlements if we do not condition our aid? Well, the in, the incentive would be if, if the United States American president said to hold new settlements, that would be a pretty big incentive. I would love that. Yeah. And I, I, I believe that's what the American president should say and, and should be very candid. No new settlements. And that this is what America uh, expects. And. Uh, and, and, and making sure that the funding, which it, it isn't, I don't think, go, go, none of the funding is used to assist with the new settlements. I mean, that, that, is, uh, that is making sure the use of the aid uh, is not for things that violate uh, human rights. Uh, and that is a position that, uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren tried to uh, articulate in her, in her campaign, which many progressives believe in, and that you can still affirm, as I do, the U.S.-Israel uh, relationship, the partnership, the cultural and 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 and, and uh, strategic val value and moral value of the relationship, while pushing for it in a more democratic, pluralistic direction, with ultimately uh, two states. Uh, I think, though, the progressive movement has a lot of work to do still to get members to a place where I am. I mean, my position is a position that is a still a minority position in the Congress. Certainly. And then I think part, I'm sorry to, 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 no. to dominate, but um, I think part of that, too, is is that when, you know, for example, a member like Summer Lee is a bit more on uh, probably she's more progressive on or more whatever I, left. Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. APAC spends millions and millions of dollars to defeat her both in her primary and then in the general election. It didn't work. But those are the kinds of things that I think progressives are up against. And you talk about money and interest all the time that I, I, I don't necessarily know if the general public understands why that chills the debate on that front. Well, absolutely. And this is why I was for a general ban on super PAC money in primaries, because you can't say, in my view, you can't say, OK, if you're a pro-Israel advocacy group, you can't spend super PAC money. But if you're a pharmacy group, you can spend it. Or if you're a, a, a group want to promote U.S.-India relationships, you can spend it. Or if you're a left labor group and you care, you can spend it. Just ban it. Ban super PAC money. This way it's facially neutral. No one can complain. And ban it in primaries. And the reality is progressives often don't have the resources. Uh, other co corporate interests do, like the health insurance, pharma. I saw it in Bernie's campaign. It was a big problem. All the health insurance were doing super PAC funding against him uh, in the early states. Ban that in the primaries. You get a much cleaner election. I guess looking at foreign policy stuff then, uh, obviously our track record over the past 25 years with foreign intervention is not the greatest, uh, given Iraq, Afghanistan, um, among other things. What do you think when you look at the U.S. support for Ukraine, what do you think our moral obligation is there ultimately in terms of how much funding, for how long, for what kind of operations, what are our red lines for how Ukraine is allowed to act? Um, yeah, how, how conditional is our support for them? What is our? What do you think the moral obligation for the United States is there? Well, we just had a vote on this as well, and I voted for continuing the funding uh, for Ukraine. I mean, Putin was absolutely in the wrong to go in to invade a sovereign country. You start with that principle. I mean, we can't just go into Mexico. We can't just go into Canada. Or into Iraq. Or Well, I, I mean... Well, I was opposed to the Iraq no, War. No, that's what I mean, though. I mean, just, I was we opposed, have done those things. You know, I was yeah, opposed yeah. to the Iraq War. I was... My first campaign, I got crushed running in a primary against someone who had voted for the Iraq War, and I ran a primary campaign against him. It's still the, one of the things I'm proudest of doing. Mm -hmm. So it was morally right, in my view, to come to, to Ukraine's defense. If we stop the aid tomorrow, you would have Putin march into Kiev. You know, the mess, mission has largely been successful. They haven't been able to make penetration into the Donbass because of the landmines, but people thought Putin would be in Kiev two, three weeks after. It's only because of the United States aid and NATO that we've prevented that. 
And I agree that there's got to be some just peace. I was on a progressive caucus letter calling for dialogue, and I got hammered for that, even while I voted for every aid package. I said, you got to have communications with uh, with Russia, with Ukraine, with, uh, with other uh, allies to help bring a just peace. And I'm all for doing that. But what I'm not for doing is until we can get to that, we're drawing our aid because that's going to mean that all of the sacrifice was in vain. I mean, Putin would just march into Kiev the minute we left. And that's that. So what I've said is I'm going to continue to support it. But I'm also one of the voices saying, let's at the same time have de-escalation and uh, look at how we have a, a just peace agreement. Do you have in your mind, when you say de-escalation in Ukraine and Russia, I'm not asking you to like create policy right now, but do you have an idea of like what that could possibly look like? The off ramps, yeah. yeah. I think it could be de-conflicting areas, ceasefire, temporary ceasefires in areas, places where we're saying that the, the conflict is not expanding. I mean, this is a conflict that was really going on since 2014, right? And then Putin marched in and made it much worse, but it wasn't like there was peace in the area. So I think de-conflicting and seeing if there are regions where you can have temporary ceasefires or not have expansion, all of that should be part of a conversation. I mean, ultimately, Ukrainian sovereignty needs to be uh, restored or we need to listen to what the Ukrainian people want in terms of a just peace. But we should be facilitating that while we're providing the aid. How do you uh, how do you feel about like U.S. or China, like navigating some of those pre peace conversations? Do you have a preference of like who that falls to, or what do you think America's role should be within that? I believe uh, that America obviously needs to continue leading the, the NATO world in supporting Ukraine. But if there are other countries that can be brokers in trying to get us to uh, adjust peace, whether that is India, Israel, which both have relationships, by the way, both with Ukraine or Russia, uh, if China can be constructive, I mean, I welcome anyone. That was the idea of multilateral uni multilateralism in the United Nations. I mean, that doesn't say America shouldn't be a leader in uh, in, in the uh, in in NATO and and in, in, uh, in leading the world. It's to say that leading the world requires pragmatism of understanding which people who can can help uh, facilitate this. Um, <clears throat> much of Joe Biden's foreign policy has been. Um, I, I've agreed with a lot, but one thing I'm a little troubled by is this orientation towards a rivalry with China, which seems to be, look, it's, it's inevitable in terms of the economic rivalry, but uh, Biden seems to think that this is fairly existential and a lot of, you know, his, his relation, uh, burgeoning relationship with Modi to, to create a rivalry or to get India more on our side in that rivalry is a part of that as well as the, the, I think, four military bases, I believe, in the Philippines that he reopened. Um, what's your position there? Because I don't want to get into another Cold War situation. I, I'm uh, understanding uh, about the, the rivalry and those economic factors there. But um, it's a bit of a, of a tough line to walk. I'm not for a Cold War. I'm on, I'm on the China Select Committee, and I've said that. I'm trying to get it. I have a bipartisan trip that I'm trying to lead to China. I can't get the Republicans to approve it. Yeah. We haven't been able to, to go to China since pre-COVID. I said, even during the Soviet Union, we talked to each other. We've got to talk to each other. But we do have to be clear-eyed about two aspects of the U.S.-China relationship. The trade deficit was a total mistake. I mean, China has a trade deficit with India, Japan, South Korea, and the United States. We hollowed out our working and middle class. We never said, let's have all of Wall Street go to London. We never said, let's have all of Hollywood go to Bollywood. We never did this to any of our coastal elite jobs. And we never said, let's have all of tech go to, uh, to, to uh, Estonia or Ukraine. But with manufacturing, we said, let it all go to China. Mm. That was a big blunder. So at the top of the U.S.-China relationship needs to be the rebalancing and lowering the trade deficit, which, by the way, is good for them because they have an export production economy at the expense of their own consumer welfare. That's why they have so much economic disparity in China. It's not working for, for China. So I would lead with that, and I would make it very clear that uh, we have to deter any invasion of ta Taiwan, that we affirm the one China policy, that uh, this is about a conversation between China and Taiwan, but you can have no coercion and no military invasion uh, of uh, of the island of Taiwan. I mean, that would be like Putin uh, it, it invading Ukraine. If you had those two frameworks, I think you could be clear-eyed about the threats and challenges China faces. 
while trying to avoid a Cold War. And that's the art of, of diplomacy and statesmanship. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And then, and based on the, the jobs that you described, that's also a reorientation of our trade policies yes. as well, um, which is which is key. I know we're bumping up against it here. I believe it is three o'clock, so we should wrap. Um, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Congressman Kana. Really thank appreciate you. your extended thank time you so today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.